Okay, we are rolling here. I have a um, a great guest today, and uh, I'm really really excited. This is actually um, Devin and I, my son, have, have hosted this podcast for about a year and a half now, and now we're kind of interviewing somebody that's actually in my industry, which is really cool, which is the marine industry and marine response um, industry. So. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to, Devin usually reads the uh, intros, but he's off on a gig again today. He's, he's, uh, he's getting really busy, which is really cool for him. So I'm really proud of him. Um, so here we go. Are you worried about the increasing frequency of natural disasters such as hurricanes? And like recently, it's been just absolutely crazy. Um, do you live in constant uh, fear or do you, live on, um, do you live on a coast or do you live on an island and wonder if... You know, when the big one does hit, is anybody around to help? Um, well, today we talk about the existing marine industry and technology and personnel that is around and, and can help. It's just putting this thing into action, putting something together into action. So I'm happy to welcome our guest, a marine expert, Chad Furman to um, Impact. So welcome, Chad. Welcome. Uh, it's really cool to have somebody in the same space um, on the show here. How are you doing? Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah. Where are, where are you today? Uh, I'm I'm working from the home office in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin, the the great nice. maritime state that it is. Nice, yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, people don't people don't think of uh, you know the states, you know Wisconsin and Wanda as being, but but they are because of the Great Lakes. I mean, the Great Lakes are massive, and um, so they re they really are. And actually, at the beginning of our show, what we start with is something called two truths and a lie. So it allows our audience to kind of get to know our our uh, our guest a little bit uh, a little bit deeper and some other things you may not know about them. And so there's, I'm going to read three items and two are a truth and one is a lie. And I'm going to have to guess which is the lie. Okay. So you're ready here, Chad? Yeah, let's, let's, let's have at it. All right. Let's see here. Number one, in 1990, I served as a student ambassador to the Soviet Union and almost caused an international incident. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Uh, number two, I have played classical guitar for over 20 years and have public publicly embarrassed myself at orchestra concerts and other events. Wow. Well, that's really, if that's true, that's really cool. Um, number three. Okay. Across 25 of in, uh, years of industry experience, I've been around the world by sea, but have never been shellbacked, which means cross the equator on board a ship that's a really good one i actually don't think i have either if that's true um and the last one here i've got one here chad is the founder and ceo of chaos ready incorporated which okay so which is the lie here um and i like the soviet <laughs> that's pretty good but i almost believe oh boy ah uh... I think, I think that you, you know, you've been in the marine industry, you know, for over 25 years. And I think you have been across the equator on a ship or a vessel of some sort. I think that's the lie. So, okay. Mm. Drum roll. So, so do I win something if I, if I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's if I right. you? yeah, you, you, you win a trip across the, uh, the equator <laughs> on a ship. <laughs> I don't want to do that. There's a lot of hazing that goes on. I've seen, I've seen stuff <laughs> from the past. Yeah, uh, so yeah. There certainly is, but uh, I, yeah. I have not uh, experienced it myself. So that actually is, is a truth. Um, mm. I've, I've been around, I've been as close as offshore Singapore, which uh, yes. as, as you probably well know is, you know, one degree about 60 miles yeah. north of yeah. the equator. Yeah. Um, so I've been going through the Suez Canal, going through the Panama Canal. Yeah. So I've, I've yeah. been around the world by the water, but uh, I never have crossed the equator on a ship. Interesting. So, wow. so that one's a okay. truth. So that's true. Oh, so I don't know. Okay. I go for, oh, man, let's go guitar. Um, okay. I, I say Soviet Union causing an international incident or almost causing an international <laughs> incident. Is that true so, too? <laughs> that's that's true as well. Yes. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> really? Want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, as as much as I can uh, yeah. for the audience, at least. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, 1990. I was a high school junior. Oh well, yeah. summer after my high school junior year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I was representing the U.S. as a student ambassador to the Soviet Union. Huh. Um, 
we were on a train uh, at the very beginning of the trip from Helsinki to St. Petersburg. Yeah. And as we were crossing the border into what, uh, you know, what at that time was the Soviet Union, um, there were a lot of, of soldiers and, and border patrol and so forth that came on board the train just to, to have a look around. Yeah. And at the time that that happened, I was in the middle of an animated conversation with uh, a couple of other passengers. We were just kind of joking around. Yeah. And I kind of made a, uh, a movement with my arm uh, <laughs> uh, back over my shoulder without looking at where I was going. Right. And I turned in time to see that I was probably within an inch, two inches of, of having elbowed a Soviet soldier in the face. <laughs> and uh, I, I cringed to think, you know, as a, a young 17 oh, year old, uh, yeah. I, I cringed to think of what the possible outcome of that could have been had I landed my, uh, my shot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That's, that's just crazy. So, um, yeah. You want to say it's anything about the, uh, the classical guitar as well? Uh, so that was, that's more of an aspirational one. Uh, I've, right. I, I have played guitar for a while, but, yeah. um, I've always been attracted to playing classical guitar, but I have not really done it to the point of being good at it, but I would love to, to kind of pick that up as another, as another side hobby of mine to, yeah. uh, yeah. just to expand the, the right side of my brain a little bit right exactly exactly so that's the that's the lie there so you you haven't uh that's pretty good oh my gosh so yeah chad, chad um it, it's really interesting you know what you do and, and you are the founder and ceo of chaos ready inc right um Correct. so that is true and it it um you know with all of the you know what, what's been going on you know recently i actually i just interviewed uh, a lady yesterday and she was down in St. St. Pete, St. Petersburg, down just north or north or south of um, Tampa, right, Florida, where uh, they just had the massive hurricane, and um, and it's just happening more and more regularly um, all over the world. I mean, globally, but in the in the U.S., um, you know, especially this this time of year, you know, the um, the storms come out of the Gulf and and um, just getting pounded, and then all these small island nations, you know, you've got I, mean, I don't even know what's happening in Cuba. I know they got hit really bad. Um, um, but it's just constant. And um, you have some some ideas because of the, there's a massive uh, fleet of offshore, offshore supply vessels, right, um, in the United States. And I don't know if, it, if, if they were mothballed or, but a lot back in the downturn, what was it, 2014, 2015, um, right. you know, because the Gulf slowed down and uh, they were parked. Um, so you have some some ideas on how to use these vessels, you know, as emergency response to help, you know, people in, in a time of need when, when, when things like this happen, when there's no, these islands or these coastal communities, they don't have water, they don't have, you know, people to help. Um, but you have mobile um, ships that are able to, you know, be able to bring people and, and water and things like that. Is that right? Or am, am I, am I, am I correct um, with what I'm saying there? <laughs> Very close, very close. I mean, the, the oh. focus is more on on the the oh. vessels that are that are currently active. Um, right, those that right. have been laid up uh, are are certainly an option. But mm -hmm. um, so I'll start by by saying this: you're, you're exactly right in talking about the the frequency of of natural and, and human affected disasters seems to be increasing. The data certainly certainly yeah. indicates that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's unpredictable where they're going to hit, uh, what type of disaster it's going to be. It could be an earthquake, could be a wildfire, could be a tsunami. You, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, so th that's unpredictable. But what is predictable is, or, or what can be predictable are the needs of the impacted regions once they're, once they're hit with it. Mm -hmm. And you can have things like, uh, like you mentioned, fuel and water, yeah. um, communications requirements, uh, mobile accommodation spaces, Mm -hmm. even some transportation hubs for like helidex and things like that yeah so while the disasters themselves are unpredictable right. the needs following those disasters are are quite predictable yeah. so we have that in in one space and then as you noted the offshore service vessels offshore supply vessels we just call mm -hmm. them osvs see, so. um, are very specifically designed for a lot of functions in the offshore energy sector mm -hmm. those same so they're designed to, to perform certain functions within the energy sector and they're not really looked at to perform other functions 
But if you look back at, at what we were just talking about, the needs following a disaster mm -hmm. and the actual capabilities of the vessel uh, of OSVs in their industrial functions, there's quite a bit of overlap there. Right. So it, it's almost uncanny how, how they resemble each other. Mm -hmm. So what Chaos Ready is attempting to do is kind of um, identify and quantify those same capabilities mm -hmm. so that in the event of a disaster, wherever these these vessels are are active if they're within a region where in a disaster hits mm -hmm. then you've got a, a first line of not a first line of defense but kind of a first line of mitigation sure to help uh help relieve some of the impact of of the crisis until some of the, the dedicated response resources can arrive which can be days if not weeks away mm -hmm. from the actual onset of the crisis yeah and, th and that's actually that's actually brilliant because, um, you know, during, during an event, like, like say a hurricane, a lot of the roads, roads are down, power, power is down, um, power poles are across the roads, trees are down, like, uh, and access is really difficult to get into these areas, right? So if you're able to get to them by boat um, and be able to take, you know, help, um, that really makes sense. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times harbor areas might be obstructed and and yeah. uh, and other things like that. And if you've got, so obviously the when you think about a disaster, you think about supplies from tankers and container ships that that can help alleviate the issue. Yeah, but you're also looking at vessels that 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 have a draft that uh, depth below the waterline sure. of 30, 40, 50 feet, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. Whereas OSVs, they don't have quite the the cargo carrying capacity, but they have drafts that, at the most, are probably twenty five feet. Right. So much more versatile and and being able to get into areas that might be somewhat restricted following, uh, following a hurricane, following an earthquake, what have you. Right, right, right. Um. So do you want to actually tell our audience a little bit more about OSVs? Um. I, I know what they are. Um. But to just explain exactly, you know, why they're different from other types of vessels. Sure, sure. They're they're kind of a, um, I almost refer to them as like a Swiss Army knife of the of the maritime world. Yeah, yeah. You've got, uh, um, of course, a lot of offshore energy in the form of of oil and 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 wind as well, um, come from these platforms that are stationary out uh, 250 miles sometimes, sometimes even more, sometimes quite a bit less. Anyways, they're the the point being they're offshore, but they have mm -hmm. to be supplied. Mm -hmm. They have to have stores for the crew they have to have fuel they have to have water uh drill rigs need to have equipment brought out to help them perform their their industrial function so the the uh, osvs are, are are what perform that function they bring the supplies out to the vessels you've got more comp or more out to the platforms you've got uh, more complex osvs that have subsea construction cranes you've got yes um those that that are dive support vessels those mm -hmm. that are uh rov platforms remote operated vehicle platforms so they, they perform all kinds of functions and they can range in size from 120 feet for a fast supply vessel yeah. to 400 500 600 feet for some of the larger more complex vessels that that, for, that perform more complex functions as well Exactly. I actually, I actually have a few photographs here. See if I can share screen here. Two seconds here. See if this works just to show some, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So there we go. So this is, <clears throat> this is kind of a typical <clears throat> OSV, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, actually, appears to be, uh... actually, this is, this is kind of interesting because I, like I mentioned, we're kind of in the same, we kind of overlap in our industries here because um, in our business, we use OSVs or uh, our clients use OSVs to put equipment for emergency marine response, right? For oil spills and et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have equipment that's, our, our equipment gets uh, uh, mounted on the, the rear of some of these ships. Yeah. I'll just yeah. show you a quick little, yeah. So basically, so lots of lots of space for carrying, um, you know, you know, pipe and uh, gear and and equipment. Yeah, and it can certainly be modified as well for um, when it came to hurricane response in uh, in Puerto Rico in 
17, I believe it was. Um, yes, I, I yes. think that was Maria. Um, yeah, that was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there were OSVs from uh, from the Gulf of Mexico area that were able to bring in uh, trucks, fuel trucks, uh, with slight modifications to the vessel, but the deck space was there, the strength of the deck was there, so mm -hmm. you know it was it was a very quick turnaround to modify it, to be able to bring fuel trucks and water trucks into into the the impacted region. Yeah, I actually had a couple of friends that own a business in the U.S. and then they had just relocated to Puerto Rico just before that hurricane hit, and uh, they were stuck there. And these, I guess, these OSVs they brought. I mean, they were bringing fuel trucks and water trucks. And they were offloading them and they, they volunteered. They just wanted to volunteer to, to help. And it was, it was just, it was absolutely bedlam and people were really desperate and somebody handed, um, said, okay, can you guide or sit on the back of this water truck and um, take it to the next village? And he, he said, yeah, no problem. And then they handed him a shotgun he said, you're get on the back. And he said, well, what's this for? He says, well, it's it's just really desperate times here and just keep everybody away you know wave it around if you have to but um so yeah really it's it's you know really sad and really difficult but um you know a lot of this a lot of this gear can be brought brought in um on board these types of ships actually i'll just turn this off now yeah and the you know one of the things i don't want to overlook is is there there yeah. are certainly i mentioned the dedicated resources dedicated response resources that are already there yeah um from military assets to um, some commercial assets that are dedicated to it, and I don't want to to lessen the 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 importance of of those um, resources at, at all. But the the point being that, as I said, it can be days, it can be up to weeks before those mm -hmm. dedicated resources can be brought to the location of the of the crisis. Right. So right. if we can leverage commercial resources that are already there yeah. to assist immediately, well, that will certainly lessen the impact. Uh, ideally, it'll save lives. It'll help uh, preserve some infrastructure, at least until a time when those dedicated resources can can be uh, brought onto location. Right, right. And um, so now with these, you know, these OSVs, for example, say in the Gulf of Mexico, do we know where they all are? At, at one point, is there a way to track them? I mean, I know there's... There is a um, a program which tracks shipping globally, um, which you can click on and find. But I don't know how much detail. I, like, is there something? Um, is is there a way to track all these right now? Or yeah. So what what you're I think what you're referring to is is yeah. known as AIS, the Automatic right. Identification System. Right. And that's now a, a requirement globally for for most commercial vessels to to carry on board. And mm -hmm. actually, what what Chaos Ready is trying to do, one of the the five or four or five objectives that we have is to create a mechanism where we can identify the resources that a, that a responding agency would need. And one of the options that we're looking at is, is building it off of the existing AIS system. AIS will tell you what vessel is located where, you know, approximately where it's going, give you the name of it. But what we need for purposes of Chaos Ready is yes. what are the capabilities that it has? Right. So if we can build off of something that's already there, we're, we're taking resources that are inherent to the commercial vessels. And we'd also like to use a capability that's already available to the industry to try and build on it, to identify those resources and bring them into, into the area. So expanding AIS when a responding entity can call on not necessarily a specific vessel, but can say, this is the capability that we need. Mm -hmm. And it opens up that line of communication to the vessel and to the vessel owner operator to facilitate a response. Right, right. So, and that's what you're working on. That's what Chaos Ready is working on. Are you working on a um, a program or an app or a way to, are, are you mer like merging the two with like getting AIS, using the AIS system and then kind of um, supplementing it or enhancing what they're able? It, exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're working yeah. on an app that does just that. Very cool. Very cool. So that's so, that's one of the objectives. There's, you know, you've you've got to talk about the being able to allow these vessels to respond, and still preserve the the um, national interests of the of the area in, in which they're responding. Yeah. You've got to talk about the commercial interests of the vessel themselves, the safety of the vessel in themselves. Um, there's a lot of aspects to it, but that's certainly one of the objectives that we're that we're going for. Right. 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 
Well, that's very, uh, that's really interesting. So any idea when, when you may uh, launch this or? So we're working, I'm working with uh, um, mm -hmm. an organization known as Apogee Earth, and uh, they are uh -huh. kind of the brains behind the, the app. And we are hoping to have something that is function tested and, and uh, proof of concept by July of, of next year, okay. which, uh, yeah. or I'm sorry, June of next year, because that is yeah. basically the opening of, of hurricane season in the Gulf of Mexico. So right. we'd like to have it something is. ready and able to go. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, I think that's fantastic. That's just, um, I mean, it's something that's really needed. Um, and it's, again, it's, is it's, I think you mentioned in one of your other chats that, you know, we, I don't know, we as humans, we're always trying to come up with something new, right? We're always designing and developing and, and building new stuff where there's a lot of this existing technology that we have, uh, the technology, the ships, it just needs to be all coordinated and put together and easily accessed right in in a, in a moment of crisis and i think i think that's what we're that's what you're that's what you're doing which is really really cool yeah that's that, that's exactly it i mean there's and there's nothing wrong with with being creative being inventive and and, yeah. and building something new but yeah i think that i see where i fall in this particular role as as more of a catalyst to to bring the the ingredients that are already there mm -hmm. and bring them together for um just a different uh, a different function a different application right 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 yeah yeah because there's so many do you any, have any idea of how many osvs are in in the gulf of mexico at at any one time i mean i mean that's a great question i mean there's um, hundreds and hundreds of yes. these guys you know we uh and it, it's it's interesting to say because i mean I, I think of you know the gulf of mexico because that's where i mean we do you know you know we do bunch of work um but i mean there's the east coast there's west coast is kind of a little bit you know it's picking up uh because of the wind farm industry right wind farm industry is really um globally right um, but, but globally i mean not just the united states canada um you know we do a fair amount of work in brazil offshore brazil and um it, it's it's pretty much everything is offshore and there's OSVs everywhere. We do majority of our business in Brazil, um, offshore with our, our with our large equipment. We do some in the U.S., but it's mostly um, in areas like that. Where um, I, I think what's going on is because of what's happening in um, in Europe um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and and the pipelines being you know shut, is that now other areas are really picking up in the world, um, such as such as Brazil. Brazil had a huge dip, and now it's coming back. Um, because of the uh, the need uh, for the offshore, and so the, I mean, there's there, I mean, there's there's so many vessels globally, um, Asia, and to be able to you know use these not just for servicing the oil and gas industry or the wind industry, but also for the emergency response um, when it when a um, a disaster happens. And again, they're being becoming much more frequent everywhere. It's you know it's shocking, but. Um, yeah, yeah. OSVs are 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 becoming increasingly ubiquitous around the world, and, and yeah, for exactly the yeah. reasons that you're talking about, Brazil is absolutely exploding right now in the offshore energy sector. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and and you know, West Africa, East Africa, yeah, all these areas, and these are yeah. are areas as well where they're more likely to to be hit by um, weather patterns, in in particular for disasters, but. You know, not mm -hmm. to mention the, of course, the tsunami from 2005 and the impact that that had. I know globally. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so these are all areas where OSVs are actually pretty active. Um, yeah. Likely, when when a disaster strikes in some of these areas, that activity is going to be shut down, not necessarily permanently, but at least for a, a short time period. Mm -hmm. So that means that these assets then become available to hopefully respond to. The crisis when uh, they're not being used commercially exactly yeah fantastic well thanks this is uh this is great any other tips or points you want to make before we uh before we wrap it up there chat um i don't think so you can you can take a look uh website is kind of in development right now yeah. but it's chaosready.org and okay. you can follow us on linkedin and you can reach right. out to me at uh, chad at chaosready.org and I'd be Fantastic. happy to answer any questions anybody has and looking forward to, to getting some partners along for the ride as, as yeah. we develop this and, and have, uh, have something to launch middle of next yeah. year.
great. Well, definitely we'll be in touch. And what we'll do is we're going to put all of the contact information in the uh, in the header for this uh, episode. And so I just want to say thank you so much, Chad. And um, yeah, we'll definitely be in touch. It's really, really cool stuff. I love it. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Nigel. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, no worries.